Good morning and welcome to this lecture uh, which is a sub part of uh, physical ergonomics. So, so far uh, we have discussed about the various components of the physical ergonomics in which we uh, discussed about the physiological aspects and uh, muscular efforts and what are the basic mechanism which takes place when uh, you perform any, uh, any, uh, any physical uh, work. So, in continuation with that lecture. Uh, as far as summary of this previous, uh, the previous lecture is concerned, so we have uh, covered this introduction about the musculoskeletal system, what is musculoskeletal system and what are its basic components about the metabolism, what, uh, what is this metabolism and what is its uh, function in uh, performing any physical work, about the basic function of cardiovascular system respiratory system and now today uh, we will be going to discuss, uh, we discussed about the muscular effort energy expenditure uh, which is in relation with any physical effort performed by human body and the rest period which is an essential component while performing a work for a prolonged period of time. So now uh, as far as today's lectures topic is concerned, we will be discussing about the muscle strength and endurance, the heat balance uh, done automatically by our body and thermoregulation. So, uh, the first kind of topic that uh, we need to discuss today is muscle strength and endurance. So, as we all know that uh, in addition to energy consideration in the operation of uh, any physical effort which is made by human muscles there are various essential factors. So, uh, that factor is strength, you need some strength, some power in order to perform work and uh, in that strength is a very necessary part. So, any kind of manual work which you are performing, it needs strength to perform that particular task. So, uh, in context with the, the muscle capacity, uh, we have to define that particular word strength. So, we need to define a strength. So, uh, all of uh, us uh, knows about the strength, so strength can be defined as the maximum force that is required or that is applied in order to perform any task in a fullest way and basically this particular strength the maximum force that can be applied by the muscle or muscle group under specified or specified conditions. So, in that uh, context basically uh, the force is uh, usually more convenient to measure as a torque. So, there are basically uh, two basic conditions under which a strength can be measured. First is static strength and the second is dynamic strength. In the static strength the measured uh, basically this static strength is measured by the human subject applying as high a force as possible against an immovable object. To avoid muscle fatigue, the duration of the applied force is short. So, so this particular period to apply a particular uh, force is short. And, uh, the tendency of body is to uh, remove that particular force because of the 
uh, fatigue avoidance or to avoid stress. So, that is uh, it is clear from the uh, definition itself that for a few second that particular force is applied and that too is uh, the force is not in uh, uh, variable condition and the force is uh, more or less constant. So, in that uh, uh, in that period of time the particular force is measured and that is its static strength which is faced by human muscles. So, now this measured value is influenced by various joint types. It may be joint types, joint angles, so the measured value of a static strength of this static strength is influenced by joint types, joint angle as well as motivation of human subject and other factors also. So, now if you have to define dynamic strength, so that it is generally this dynamic strength is tested under the conditions that involve changes in joint angles and motion speed. So, this particular dynamic strength is uh, mostly affected by the speed of the motion pattern with higher strength values being associated with slower speeds. So, if we have to compare this static uh, muscular activity and dynamic muscular activity, so I have put one table which is shown here in which the comparison between uh, the static muscular activity and dynamic muscular activity is shown. So, uh, this particular table uh, is full of examples and in this way uh, the difference between these two will be uh, cleared to the large extent. So, the description is that in, uh, in context with the static muscular activity, it is a sustained contraction, but in dynamic muscular activity, rhythmic contraction and relaxation takes place. As an example, when you hold a part in a static position or squeezing a pair of pliers, so those force of actions that are involved in this activity comes in this static muscular activity. As well as dynamic muscular activity is concerned, cranking a pump handle is one of the kind of example where the load is continuously varying and uh, turning a screwdriver in which the, the force that we are applying is dynamic in nature. So, to the uh, it some at some point of time it is going to its uh, maximum of its force and uh, then it is again going to zero then it is going to uh, uh, peak of its uh, uh, magnitude so in this way the dynamism of uh, the movement is taking place in the movement taking place and uh, these are the examples that you can put to describe dynamic muscular activity as far as physiological effect is concerned, so this is particular static muscular activity, it reduce, it reduces basically uh, blood flow to tissue and this particular reduced blood flow to tissue restricts oxygen supply and waste removal. In that particular uh, case, lactic acid is generated and metabolic activity is an anaerobic. So, the whole metabolism is anaerobic. So, anaerobic is uh, absence of oxygen or very less amount of oxygen is involved. 
in the dynamic muscular activity the adequate blood flow allows oxygen supply and waste removal needs to be satisfied and metabolism is aerobic. So, uh, basically this uh, uh, these all difference, so owing to differences in the required measurement apparatus static strength is uh, more is more easily assessed than dynamic strength. And most of the available data on the human strength are in terms of static strength. Yet, uh, uh, in real activities or most of the work includes uh, dynamic muscular efforts and uh, dynamic effort is physiologically less costly to the muscle than static effort. So, uh, this was all about the comparison of uh, static and dynamic uh, muscular activity. So, now we come to the next thing that is one of the most important thing that is to know or to become aware of the factors that affecting strength. So, uh, as a general uh, activity uh, performer, we know that what are the uh, rough parameters which affects strength. So, uh, these has been uh, these criteria have been uh, categorized in several factors. So, basically uh, this as you are aware that there are significant variation in the strength among uh, among us or among each and every individuals. So, the differences in measured static strength between the strongest and weakest worker is or can be identified. So, that identification can be done on the basis of size, gender, age, physical conditioning. So, these are all the factors which affects the strength. So, uh, these are the uh, uh, possible factors that explain each wide range in human physical st strength. So, these are the following uh, personal characteristics like size in which height, body, body weight, build, physical conditioning, gender, age, these are the some of the factors. And certainly the size and physical conditioning of the workers are key factors, size does matter. So, if you will see that you can uh, you can achieve maximum strength at the age of nearly 23 to 35 so age is also a factor in strength capability so this particular strength achieves a maximum level in human when they are in between let's say year 23 to is 35 years so it decreases slowly until the mid 40s and then it decreases more rapidly thereafter. So, in mid 50s uh, average strength is about 80 percent of the peak and in the mid 70s it is about 60 percent of its peak. So, this data has been taken from the uh, original source of this rule of thumb seems to be. So, one uh, writer J. Roybuck and Kroemer in his book Engineering Anthropometry Methods so, they have uh, described this factors affecting strength. So, I have taken this data from that book and uh, as well as in comparing the strength uh, between uh, the male and female workers. So, it comes as no surprise that uh, male workers are stronger and a rule of thumb that is frequently cited in ergonomic literature is that that average strength of uh, females is uh, 67 percent it means 
2 by third, uh, 2 thirds sorry, uh, the average strength of males over the various muscle groups uh, that are normally tested in the body. So, this was all about the factors and uh, uh, that uh, another uh, factor that remained uh, uh, untouched. So, that is physical exercise can increase can increase the strength by as much as 50 percent. So, this was all about the factors that affect strength and uh, the again uh, the next topic is uh, your endurance. So, basically we are talking about muscle endurance. So, this muscle endurance is defined as the capability to maintain an applied force over the time. So, this particular term is uh, mostly explained in the context of static force. So, the ability to maintain his or her maximum static force last only a short time. So, uh, the gender relationship between force capability and time I have put uh, in the next figure that I am going to show you. So, before that, that uh, let us have a uh, some f uh, facts about that, that after about 8 to 10 minutes a person can only apply about the 25 percent of the maximum static force achieved at the beginning of test. And finding supports the use of a mechanical work holder rather than requiring a worker to grasp a work unit. So, uh, this is the particular figure which is uh, showing that the strength endurance. Uh, so, this is a general relationship between the maximum force capability that can be applied by a person as a function of time. So, this particular figure is showing the strength endurance. So, this is uh, particularly showing the force capability and time as indicated in this figure. So, this plot is uh, suggesting that uh, let us say about after 8 to 10 minutes a person can apply only So, a person can apply only about 23 percent of the maximum static force that could be achieved at the start of the rest, start of the test sorry and due to the onset of muscle fatigue. So, this finding is important in the design of a work methods because a worker cannot be expected. to grip a particular object continuously at a high magnitude of force a high force level for an for let us say prolonged period of time. So, the general rule is to use a mechanical work holder rather than re require the worker to perform that function. So, uh, a somewhat similar relationship uh, occurs in the dynamic muscle activity 
in which individual is applied to apply forces during a repetitive portion cycle. So, muscle fatigue gradually causes the applied dynamic force to decline over time, but this decline is slower than in the case of an applied static force and a sustainable bottom level is reached that is higher than 23 percent as observed for static force. So, uh, the difference is that that dynamic muscular activity is in fact uh, physiologically physiologically better for the muscle cells than applying a, a static force. So, this was all about factors affecting strength and uh, the phenomena uh, uh, about uh, muscle endurance. Now, the next topic which uh, we are going to understand is uh, heat balance and thermoregulation. So, as we all know that uh, our body uh, converts uh, or our body adjusts himself according to the temperature of the surrounding. So, if temperature is ex exceeded then the required temperature of the human body it regulates that uh, uh, internal temperature and it and if it is low then accordingly it also reacts and maintain the body temperature. So, here uh, that is why uh, some facts and uh, some fundamentals regarding uh, to the thermoregulation we are going to discuss uh, in this slide. So, uh, the topic is thermoregulation and heat balance. So, apart from uh, since we have studied in the previous lecture that uh, the uh, there are three factors which are affecting the capacity of the human body. First is oxygen consumption second is heart rate and third is that perspiration or maintaining maintaining the proper thermal balance. So, inside uh, the third factor that we are going to discuss here is the ability of a body to maintain a proper thermal balance. So, if the body temperature rises too far above its normal level or falls too far below that particular level the body function is impaired. So, uh, now for our discussion of thermal balance we need to know some of the facts that uh, a normal body core temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. In fact, uh, uh, before uh, going to explain these uh, things, let us uh, let us develop a model of our human being as an. So, this part, uh, so uh, suppose our human body is consisting of a core surrounded by a shell. So, human body as a core shell system. So, uh, particularly what is happening here like suppose this is a uh, particular human being and there is a outer covering that is protecting human body. So, this particular is shell 
and this region is core. So, to understand this thermoregulation in a better way, let us consider our human body as a core shell system. Suppose this is the core and this is So, this particular is assumed as a shell and this is core and this whole is our human body. So, for our discussion for thermal balance, we have assumed that this human body is consisting of a core which is surrounded by shell. This shell is perhaps uh, one, one inch thick, one inch or let us say 2.5 mm thick and it basically it consists of uh, this particular shell consists of a skin and flesh immediately beneath it. So, the core consist of organs in the body. This particular core, so this core contains the various uh, components inside that. So, such as heart, liver, lungs, stomach, intestine and in fact brain should also be included although it uh, confounds the core in shell model somewhat. So, the brain, liver, heart and working muscles are the primary generators of the heat within the body. So, so the primary generator of heat within the body are and main is working muscles. So, the muscles function to convert this particular working muscle function to convert food and oxygen into mechanical output. But the conversion process from food and oxygen to mechanical output is only let us say 20 to 30 percent efficient and remaining energy is in the form of heat. So, here we can see that basically it is nothing but the second law of thermodynamics that each uh, the, the kind of input that we are providing cannot directly convert it and 100 percent cannot be converted into output. Some of the part will go into sink that sink here is as a heat. So, uh, heat is containing the uh, remaining portion is as a 70 to 80 percent of the all the energy that has been obtained from the food and oxygen. So, here heat is transferred from the core to the shell by blood 
flowing in the cardiovascular system. So, blood is mostly water which has ideal thermal properties for this purpose. So, ideal thermal properties is like a high uh, volumetric specific heat and uh, thermal conductivity as well. So, at the sh uh, now uh, when heat goes from core to shell perspiration, perspiration is produced in the skin and then it is evaporated to the atmosphere. Evaporation extracts heat from the body and convection and radiation also contribute to the heat loss if the surrounding temperature is lower than the skin temperature. So, body temperature in the core is controlled by complex thermoregulation system. So, this body temperature in the core is controlled by a complex thermo regulation system basically that attempts this uh, complex thermo regulation system attempts to maintain a set point of value for our body and that is approximately 37 degree Celsius. So, that is why the first line of this particular slide is mentioning that normal body core temperature is 37 degree Celsius that in Fahrenheit 98.6 Fahrenheit. So, this is our normal body core temperature and core is made up of what? Core is made up of various organs inside our body. So, those organs I have listed down, the major organs I have listed down and those have the major uh, responsibility to take care of this thermoregulation system within the body. <coughs> so, uh, the body core temperatures that increase or decrease significantly from this particular value mean trouble. So, core temperature above 38 degree Celsius tend to reduce the physiological performance temperature when temperature of the body is above 40 degree Celsius. So, uh, the body gets disabled if temperature above 42 degree Celsius Fahrenheit 107.6 Fahrenheit. So, this particular temperature is likely to cause death. Now, uh, in the following regime if we talk about the uh, temperature below 35 degrees Celsius, so basically if the lower than the normal body temperature are called hypothermia. So, in fact, uh, one more point uh, which uh, needs uh, to be uh, known that lower than normal body temperatures are known as hypothermia and can also have severe consequences if the deviation becomes too large. So, below about 35 degree Celsius, the central nervous system coordination is reduced. So, the coordination 
in the among the various part of the central nervous system is reduced and the person becomes apathetic and person becomes apathetic. Below 32 degrees Celsius muscles become very rigid and the person loses his consciousness. So, loss of consciousness likely to happen and when the temperature is below 30 degrees Celsius the muscles become very rigid and in fact there is a severe cardiovascular stresses and in fact the death occurs when body temperature drops to around 27 degree Celsius. So, these are the very serious facts that uh, a person must be aware because these are the limitations uh, of our body and these are the temperature uh, domain uh, and, and a certain domain a certain uh, uh, so, uh, up to certain temperature our body uh, is, is uh, performing a function and if it is below certain temperature, so these kind of things are happening. If the our normal body core temperature is above 37 degree Celsius, so uh, th these sorts of uh, happening are uh, uh, making our body in a troublesome situations and uh, the person will not be uh, in position to uh, make a recovery out of that particular situation. So, this was all about the thermoregulation and the conditions where the body can survive and body cannot survive. So, as far as body's thermoregulation system and some sort of uh, calculation is concerned, so uh, this is a particular equation through which we can uh, uh, speculate the uh, thermoregulation and uh, thermal balance as well. So, the body's thermoregulation system maintains this particular body temperature within the narrow range about normal by achieving a thermal balance with the environment. So, environmental temperature is uh, should be uh, well should be in well range in order for a human performance. So, this particular thermal balance involves heat exchange between the body and environment and uh, that can be expressed in the form of equation. The equation is given here. So, delta H C equals to m minus e plus or minus r plus or minus c minus w. So, this particular equation is used to evaluate the thermoregulation of our body. So, where this particular delta H c is the net change in heat content in the body. So, that net change in the heat content means heat gained or lost. M is the metabolic energy produced. E is the heat lost through perspiration and evaporation, where R is the radiant heat loss or gain, C is the heat loss or gain by convection and W is the work performed by the body. So, appropriate units in the equations are kilocalorie. or kilo joule. So, uh, although this particular equation is not uh, practical for actual calculation, but it is a useful conceptual model in order to have an approximate uh, evaluation of or uh, in order to have a complete discussion of how body temperature can be regulated and how much uh, particular energy is required in order to regulate that particular temperature of the human body. So, assessing the terms on the right hand side of the equation, the metabolism is always a positive term. 
because of the heat generation that uh, accompanies the biochemical reaction associated with it. So, it will always uh, be taken as a positive. Since here uh, the evaporation is taking as a negative term, so it will always be a negative term as it is indicated by the minus sign. So, uh, the minus sign is appearing because the heat of vaporization required to convert perspiration that is mostly water to vapor. So, much of the heat is extracted from the body. So, that is why this negative sign is appearing here in the equation. Radiation R can be positive or negative. So, uh, this uh, particular radiation is uh, positive or negative depending on the whether the body is cooler or warmer. Uh, it is cooler or warmer than it is uh, surrounding basically. Here the next term is convection. So, uh, convection uh, involves the transfer of heat by the flow of fluid past the surface of an object. So, convection can be positive or negative. So, here uh, W is also uh, taking as a negative. So, W is work performed by the body. So, uh, since work energy term will always require energy expenditure and hence it will be hence will be taken as negative term. So, now things are clear that why we are taking uh, these things as a positive or negative or plus or minus. So, uh, the condition is like when delta H c equals to 0 in the heat exchange equation. So, what is the meaning of being 0 this uh, as a right hand side of the equation. So, it means that body is in thermal balance with its environment. So, this delta H c is the ideal condition where body is in thermal balance with its environment when delta H c is positive or negative, it means there is a net heat gain or heat loss that translates into an increase or decrease in body core temperature. So, thermal regulation system, this particular thermal regulation system of our body tries to compensate for the deviation from the normal temperature by increasing heat generation when body temperature drops below normal and by expelling heat from the body when its temperature is above normal. So, in this way the regulation of body temperature is uh, carried out. So, uh, so, what we have discussed here, uh, I am going to write it here for uh, retaining in your memory that delta H c can be positive, it can be 0 and it can be negative. This is the thermal balance uh, condition where body is in thermal balance with the surrounding if the temperature is 
in this condition when delta H C is positive. So, uh, this particular thermoregulation system tries to compensate for that deviation from normal temperature. So, that the temperature of the body could be nearly approximately equal to the temperature of the surrounding. So, that is why those control strategy are guiding by the equation that I have mentioned in the previous slide. So, here there are three automatic mechanism used by the body to try to regulate body temperature. So, there are basically uh, these are well known facts, but uh, we need to uh, uh, become aware of these facts also, because uh, uh, to in order to uh, make our body uh, fully functional, we need to learn these aspects as these aspects are uh, very, very much important in order to understand the, uh, the physical ergonomics uh, in, a, in a better way. So, uh, this automatic body mechanism uh, used by the body to try to regulate the body temperature. The first kind of mechanism is sweating, shivering and constricting or diluting, uh, dilating blood vessels. So, why sweating has occurred? This particular mechanism has uh, generally occurs in the body to increase heat losses by evaporation. Shivering to increase heat generation. That heat generation is performed by metabolism within the body. So, after sweating, shivering, the next automatic body mechanism is constricting and dilating blood vessels. So, this particular mechanism happens because of the reason that a human body has to reduce or increase blood flow. So, in this way uh, these particular uh, main three mechanism uh, which has been uh, uh, used by the body itself. So, that the temperature of the body can be regulated to its normal level. And in addition to it uh, a person experiencing a net heat or loss is likely to take a variety of conscious actions to mitigate that effect. So, uh, some of the conscious actions uh, I also have listed down those things are to wear clothes, sun and shade or exercising. So, these are the external uh, uh, what you can say external uh, remedies that you can uh, take in order to regulate your body temperature. So, in that wearing clothes so, uh, depending on the weather, whether it is a uh, uh, cold session, so you have to wear warmer clothes and if, you, if there is a uh, excessive uh, heat uh, outside the body, so you have to wear light clothes. Second is in uh, colder season, uh, moving out uh, 
moving into the sunlight that is the option or moving out of the sunlight and into the shade in hot weather and uh, like uh, if if you uh, if you face the cold or a windy weather so you have to add more and more layers of cloth in that particular season and uh, the the third kind of conscious action is including the exercising the body in cold weather to increase body heat so so exercising the body to increase blood circulation as well as body heat so these are the main uh, conscious actions depending on the weather the weather is cold or hot you will perform you perform the action and uh, in this way that uh, discussion of the regulation of body temperature is ending here so uh, i am going to close this lecture uh, uh, but before that let's have a uh, some uh, interesting fact that uh, uh, did you know that body's machinery adapts to cope with heat to early, early each summer most of the feel the heat and fatigue quite easily with the progression of summer we get used to the heat that getting used to is a phenomena known as heat acclimatization and involves several adaptation including developing a large blood volume providing more blood to ferry heat to the skin for loss to the environment and an increase in how much sweat we can produce obviously which carries heat of the body when it evaporates so our sweat glands can become so well trained that in extreme cases we can sweat several liters per hour just uh, uh, one thing that i have added for you just to create humor that if you were a supervisor in a steel company who is taking care of the work done by the subordinates how will you schedule their work and will you consider rest time if yes then for how much time so that particular uh, the, the cartoon i have added uh just to uh, have a recall about the rest period that we learned in the previous lecture uh, so before ending let's have a brief uh, history of human physiology because uh, we have to as a tribute we have to uh, uh, recall those uh, uh, researchers and uh, the persons who have contributed largely to the ergonomics so uh, the physiological studies date back to the ancient civilization of india and egypt alongside anatomical studies but did not utilize dissection or vivisection so in 420 bc uh, to the time of hippocrates also known as father of medicine and uh, jean fernel in 1497 to 1558 a french physician introduced the term physiology so jean fernel and hippocrates have contributed largely to the economics thank you very much